the year. The chairman is here, so the chairman is Good morning, everyone. Hmm? Am I on? Oh, I am on. I can hear myself now. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to, going to go ahead and get started. My name is Cynthia Bryant, and I'm president of the FCC Benjamin Hooks Chapter of Blacks in Government. Um, we are so honored to have President Frederick with us today from Howard University. And we're going to begin, and oh, I also want to thank some of our regional representatives, our regional vice president. The chairman is here, is going to give some opening remarks in just a moment. And we are waiting for uh, National President Darlene Young. But we're going to go ahead and get started um, with opening remarks from Chairman Wheeler. So, Chairman Wheeler, come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, and and uh, welcome to uh, to everybody. Um, Cynthia, thanks for all the efforts that you have uh, put into um, today, um, and uh, to everybody who is here uh, in the room, as well as to all of you out there in uh, cyberspace <laughs> who are streaming this. You know, Cynthia and I were talking uh, a, a moment ago that. Um, that it's it's actually it's wonderful to be able to stream and to be able to expand outside of these walls but we have to also reorient our thinking to the fact that we're not just speaking with this crowd but we're speaking with a crowd that is uh, all across uh, the country and uh, and sitting at their desks and and elsewhere i also want to welcome uh dr wayne frederick um thank you very much for coming uh, mr president um, I was telling Dr. Frederick uh, a moment ago when I uh, when I met him that I had um, seen him on C-SPAN being interviewed by Brian Lamb in one of those 60-minute let me ask you every question that could possibly come to mind sessions. And at that point in time, he was the um, the interim, the provost and the interim president of Howard. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this guy is really sharp, a surgeon and an administrator. And, um, and so what I saw in the paper that he had been named uh, the president of Howard for real, the full-time president of, of, of Howard, I was going, yes, this is good because I know this guy. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Frederick, for being with us uh, uh, today. I came here uh, for a specific reason today. And that is that I wanted to thank the FCC staff for all of your efforts to close gaps in our society. Um, you know, Commissioner Clyburn has been leading the charge on, uh, on reframing Lifeline so that it closes some of the economic gaps. Commissioner Rosenworcel has coined the term the homework gap to talk about the difficulty that st some students have, and it looks like it's like between three and five million students, that's a lot of people, uh, have in terms of being able to get online to do their school work from home. Um, the people in, in, uh, in CGB um, have been uh, working hard on the disabilities gap because we often think of things in term gaps in terms of economics. We really don't think it in terms of uh, abilities to use telecommunications. And if we don't use the technology to help solve challenges, uh, physical challenges as well as economic challenges, then shame uh, on us. Um, by a three to two vote of the commission, as you know, we reformed the E-rate program, brought it into the 21st century, um, and uh, this year alone, there are 20 million American students who will have the internet at their school desk 
that they didn't last year because of the work that you all have done and the work that this agency has done. And that's just the start of this whole overhaul. And so we have a plethora of challenges, a plethora of gaps, and we have miles to go before we sleep because there are too many Americans that are still, despite these and other efforts, still bypassed by the essential characteristic of the 21st century, and that is how we connect in a way that mankind has never been able to connect before. And that's what our job is. That yes, it's a matter of economics, but it's also a matter of education, it's also a matter of opportunity, it's also a matter of understanding, and we have to recognize all of those challenges. And collectively here at the Commission, we have to work on all of those challenges. Because all of life today revolves around being connected. You can't get a job. You can't apply for benefits, let alone, you know, go on Netflix. But how we define who we are is all about how we define how we connect and what we do to make sure that everybody has the ability to connect and the ability to use the technology. So I just came to say thank you to all of you for your efforts as we all roll up our sleeves and go after that challenge, for it is the great challenge of the 21st century, and it's a privilege that all of us have to be able to impact that and to have our own role in it. So thank you all very much for coming again. Dr. Frederick, thank you for being here, sir. Wayne A.I. Frederick, M.D., M.B.A., F.A.C.S., was elected 17th president of Howard University in 2014. As a triple alumnus, Dr. Frederick's dedication to Howard University spans more than two decades, beginning with his enrollment as a student. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree, a Doctor of Medicine, and completed his surgical residency training at Howard University Hospital. After fulfilling his postdoctoral research and surgical oncology fellowships at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Frederick began his academic career as Associate Director of the Cancer Center at the University of Connecticut, where he also served on the Department of Surgical Faculty. Since returning to Howard University in 2006, Dr. Frederick has served as Interim President, Provost and Chief Academic Officer, Associate Dean in the College of Medicine, Division Chief in the Department of Surgery, Director of the Cancer Center, and Deputy Provost for Health Sciences. He also earned a Master of Business Administration degree. As a distinguished researcher and surgeon, Dr. Frederick is the author of numerous peer review articles, book chapters, abstracts, and editorials. He has also received numerous awards honoring his outstanding scholarship and service. In 2014, Congress recognized him for his contributions in addressing health disparities among African Americans and historically underrepresented groups. Through his experience as a scholar and administrator, Dr. Frederick continues to support innovative solutions to further the mission of Howe University and support the success of its students. As an alumni of Howe University, and without further ado, I am honored to present to you 
the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A. I. Frederick. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. I'll <clears throat> the topic, um, as you see this morning, is a century of black life history and culture. I'm going to give you the Howard University perspective on this, um, which obviously is, is my bias, but I think an important bias um, to have, I might add. I'd, le I'd like to start with this slide because when I think of Howard University and I think of what Howard University meant at its inception and what it means today and what I hope to leave it um, with is excellence is the key issue for me. Excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. This first um, slide here, this picture, this woman here is my mom. Um, Francis is her first name. She celebrated her 50th year as a nurse on Sunday. And I'm still in the throes of trying to convince her that it's time to retire, but <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm going to convince her. I mention that because she was a, and still continues to be a significant influence um, on my surgical career, but also on my life in general. The gentleman to the far right is Dr. LaSalle of Fall, uh, one of my mentors. And he, in 1948, could only apply to two medical schools in this country. He was a graduate of what was then known as Florida A&M College, is today known as Florida A&M University. And he, despite having one B in his transcript coming out of Florida A&M, could only apply to two medical schools in this country because of what was set up at the time. He was 18 years old, um, applied to those two, and didn't get into either. And his, college, his then college president um, drove to uh, Washington, D.C. to convince the Howard University president to admit him to medical school. And fortunately for us, he was admitted. The other medical school that he applied to was Meharry. So I often tell my Meharry colleagues their loss our gain. Because he went on to graduate number one in his class and become the first president of the American Cancer Society, the first president of the American College of Surgeons. And I can go on and on. Had a distinguished career. And I think that really exemplifies what Howard University has been about. And when we talk about black history and and culture, et cetera. Howard University has been the institution that has provided opportunity. And just as Dr. LaFall had that opportunity, it continues to do that today. Charles Drew, the gentleman in the middle, um, was a world-renowned surgeon as well as scientist. And what we do today in terms of blood and plasma preservation, he was really the person, the bright, uh, the brilliant mind behind that. And this quote on this slide comes from him. Excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. That's something that he often said when, when he was at Howard University and something that we continue to practice today at Howard University. Howard's charter was signed by President Andrew Johnson from March 2nd, 1867. I know this is a century of black history, life, and culture, but Howard University in 2017 will celebrate its 150th anniversary. And I think it's important for us to recognize just the extent of that Howard University history. It started initially with six departments. And these six departments at the time were known as the Normal, Collegiate, Theological, Law, Medical, and Agriculture. Howard, Uni Howard University has a hospital on its campus which actually predated the university by five years. Howard University Hospital started in 1862 and was known as Freedmen's Hospital at the time. <clears throat> the Howard University founded as a university for the education of youth in the liberal arts and sciences. The other thing about our charter that I think is worth noting is that race and ethnicity was never mentioned. The only thing that was mentioned in the charter was opportunity. And I think that's extremely important for us to note because we have to continue to provide that opportunity as our society changes. Howard University was unique in that it enrolled black, white, males, and females, and had black and white trustees, students, and faculty. And just think about this at the time. Um, black universities and colleges after Civil War in the South didn't allow mixing of races. Without any law on the books, Howard University had a very comprehensive atmosphere and environment way back then. 
the first board of trustees consisted of the 17 original incorporators. This is a slide of the first faculty of the College of Medicine. What is important to note on this slide is that there are two black men on this slide. Augusta and Purvis were both surgeons. Interestingly enough, Purvis has the distinction of probably being the first black surgeon in this country to take care of a U.S. president who was shot and he was part of the team that took care of that president. What was interesting to note is at that time, antisepsis wasn't something that we did. And so as people were riding their horses and had their hands in manure, they would then come and probe the wounds um, of that then president who had a superficial gunshot wound that did not enter his abdomen or his chest. But because they were probing the wound with dirty hands every day, um, he got an infected wound and subsequently died from that um, sepsis. So the surgeons who were actually taking care of him actually probably killed the president at the time, unfortunately. Now the first um, department to open was the normal department and this, the, the first students consisted of four white daughters of the trustees and faculty members at Howard. So we talk about our university a lot and we, we have the distinction of being a historically black college and university which is a federal designation that came about in the 1960s. I point this out to people as well because as a 17th president, I'm only the seventh black man to be president of the university. The 10 prior presidents prior to the first black president were all white men, which again is not something that I think um, people think of Howard University. Howard University is named after its third president who was one of the original incorporators, Jennifer, General Oliver Otis Howard who served simultaneously as the commissioner of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, the Freedmen's Bureau. And that is how the funding for the university came about. He was the person who decided where funds should go, and he felt that this was a worthy cause and did that today. I wish I could approach Congress in that manner, which there was one person I could just approach and say, I think we need a couple new buildings because that's the right thing to do today. The Freedmen's Bureau educational activities stopped in 1873, however, and Howard survived financially during that period of time on private donations from individuals and organizations and selling of some of Howard's land. Sounds kind of similar to challenges that we may have today. So my alum in the audience, we certainly will continue to ask you to support our university with your contributions. During the period of 1879 to 1928, Howard endured a period of segregation and discrimination that was significant. Black scholars trained at the best white institutions in the country came to Howard to teach and assume administrative positions. Um, I was just having a conversation with uh, one of your members about Ernest Just as an example, who was a brilliant scholar and came to Howard. Um, Elaine Locke, whose um, remains were just interred. Uh, recently, Ralph Bunch, um, and just to name a few. All of these great scholars of the time did not have welcoming environments in which they could practice their craft and therefore came to Howard University. As I said before, university presidents um, were white, but blacks began to assume top administrative positions during the 1920s. And by late 1920s, university community adopts an attitude that they must have a black president. Mordecai Wyatt Jensen was the first elected was, was elected first black president in 1926 and served until 1960, and then began the trend of having a black president at the university. Um, James Cheek of note had a long tenure at Howard, a 20 year tenure, and over that period of time, Howard University became a significant landowner. So when you drive around the university campus, a lot of the property that exists around the university that we own today, we own because of James Cheeks um, during his period of time, his presidency, what he did during that period of time. In 1928, Congressman Lewis Crampton of Michigan initiates and pushes passage of legislation authorizing the U.S. Congress to make an annual appropriation to the university. And that is how the federal appropriation that Howard University receives today began. That appropriation required that the university present to Congress every year the budget, plans for buildings, etc. That we no longer do, but every year the President of the United States and Congress, when they put together the budget, have an appropriation embedded in there for the university. There was significant growth under Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, who was the first African-American president. 
Um, in, when he started in 1926, there were eight schools and colleges, and none were fully accredited, with an enrollment of about 1,700. By 1950, there were 10 schools and colleges, and all were fully accredited. He thought it was necessary for us to be part of the mainstream. He expanded the enrollment significantly to 6,000 students, and you can see that the budget went from $700,000 a year to $8 million. The, the budget at Howard University now is about $800 million at this present time, and with 20 new buildings during his period of time. So significant growth and expansion um, during that time. Today we have 13 schools and colleges. Um, nine we consider in the academic affairs arena, and you can see them listed here. And we have four schools in the health sciences um, area. We are the only school, the only university in the country to have a law school, a divinity school, a medical school, a dental school, a pharmacy school, and own its own hospital. The only one in the country. The other important thing to note here as well is that the enrollment at Howard University currently is 10,300 students, and we have programs of about 153 programs. Howard University Hospital is fully owned by the university. It is not a separate entity from the university. It's a division of the university at present. These are, this is the breakdown of the, tot the total number of degree programs we have. As you can see, we have 64 undergraduate programs. But what sets Howard University apart as a historically black college and university is the number of PhD programs and masters and doctoral programs that we have. And we are the largest producer of African American PhDs in this country every year. The last two years we graduated over, just over 100 um, African Americans with PhDs and we'll do the same thing next week Saturday. This is a picture of commencement at Howard in 1957. And you can see the honorees here. Just think about that day. Jackie Robinson, Patrick Marlin, and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I would love to be able to make that announcement of providing those honorary degrees on that particular day. <clears throat> we had a special convocation on October 7, 1994, where honorary degree recipient was Nelson Mandela. I put this up because Howard has a very tight connection to the African diaspora, always has and certainly always will. Nelson Mandela came to the US and the first university he visited on that trip was Howard University. And so we are very proud of that continued connection. Our mission is very much the same as it was at the inception of the university, to provide an opportunity for those who otherwise would not um, to be able to attain a certain type of education. We can't talk about black history, life, and culture in the U.S. without getting a, an idea of what the landscape holds. I lift this from an article from January 2014 in, in the New York Times. And this talks about what, where certain ethnic groups are in America. And it has some very surprising statistics, but things that I think also we don't often pay attention to. While comp comprising only 2% of the U.S. adult population, Jews make up a third of the current Supreme Court, a third of all the American Nobel laureates in this country, and two-thirds of the Tony Award-winning lyricists and composers. This article pointed out that most fundamentally, groups rise and fall over time. And when you look at generations, whether it's a first-generation immigrant or a second-generation immigrant, their experience and their outcomes are very different. So Asian American kids overall had SAT scores that are on average 143 points above the national average in 2012, including a 63-point edge over white Americans. A 2005 study of 20,000 adults found that a third-generation Asian American students performed no better academically than white students. That edge and advantage that they initially had gets eroded from generation to generation. What's even more compelling today is that last year, in 2014, for the first time in the history of America, more students by percentage that were high school graduates that were considered black went on to college than white Americans for the first time in our history. So 82.4% of all Asian Americans who graduated from high school went to college last year. 70% of all blacks who graduated from high school went to college last year. 
67% of all whites who graduated from high school went to college last year. For the first time in our educational history, the, the percentage of blacks who graduate from high school are attending college. Now, getting in is just one part of it, right? Finishing is key, and so we'll talk about that as well. Why is it important and why should higher education be a part of our black history and our future? Estimated lifetime achievement earnings by educational achievement, you can see here the higher level of attainment um, through education, which I still think is a great economic escalator of our civil rights movement, is still today has a significant impact on the outcomes that you will expect people to see and to attain. The unemployment rate currently in our country is significantly tied to educational level as well. As you can see, less likely to be unemployed if you have a bachelor's degree as opposed to if you have less than a high school diploma. And among blacks in particular, this, these numbers are even more skewed. Earnings and unemployment rates by educational attainment, again, you can see here in a different format, and you can see it related to the unemployment rate back in 2012, where the percentages are significantly lower if you hold professional and doctoral degrees versus if you have less than a high school diploma. The work of the future is also important. There are estimates that by 2020, 35% of the jobs will require a bachelor's degree or higher. That's significantly different from back in 1973, where only 16% of those jobs would require that type of education. What is also interesting is that the U.S. is not in the top 10 of countries in high school graduation rates among 25 to 34-year-olds. It's actually ranked 12th, and you can see some of the countries who rank ahead of the U.S. And as you look at those countries, you can think of the economies as well in terms of where those economies are heading. So when we look today in terms of what enrollment is doing, what, what we're doing on the enrollment front at our colleges and universities, it usually follows the trend of the economy. When the economy is down, more people enroll in college, in community colleges, in co colleges and universities in an attempt to get an education and obtain some type of skill set so that they can be um, gainfully employed. Once the economy begins to heat up and, pro and prosper, more people go into the job market and move away from colleges and universities. And that's the trend that we have been seeing today. Most recent data is showing that enrollments at the American College have slid slightly. We expect that as the economy gets better, less people um, will enter uh, and enroll in our colleges. Despite that, Howard University is enjoying a significant um, increase in our applications, as high as 15% um, increase in our medical school in particular, where we have 115 spots a year. Last year, we had 7,700 applicants. This year, we have 9,400 applicants for 115 spots. Um, Johns Hopkins, I met with their dean yesterday, they expect to get 6,500 applications for their 120 spots. So it just goes to show you the demand for Howard education, how strong it is. <clears throat> now, I, I like to, I'd like to talk about this and put this slide up because there is a lot of cynicism in our society about our youth. And I'm the father of a 10 and 8 year old, and I think very highly of them. And there's actually data to actually support the fact that our cynicism about our youth is misplaced. This is an article in the Washington Post back in November where they looked at data. And if you look at data and you compare back to the 1950s, the rate of delinquency, truancy, promiscuity, alcohol abuse, and suicide is currently down to levels unseen since the 1950s. So despite our cynicism about what our youth are doing today, we, we have data that suggests that that is probably misplaced. Now, poor students don't stay in college, and that's a fact. So the biggest barrier to matriculating successfully through our universities today is economics. It is the single biggest factor. The reason that Howard University students drop out 
the primary reason is finances. Academic aptitude is nowhere close to the impact of the financial impact. Low-income students who scored between 1,200 and 1,600 on the SATs were half as likely to finish college than their counterparts in the top 25% of the income di distribution. So it just goes to show you that that one factor, that economic factor, the, the major impact it has on that ability to matriculate. For many students who receive federal Pell Grants, meaning that they are in the highest category of need, the socioeconomic barriers become insurmountable. The maximum Pell Grant award is 5,800. At Howard University, we match the maximum, we match any Pell Grant award that students get. So if you get 5,800 from the federal government, you automatically get 5,800 from Howard University, regardless of what other scholarship aid you may get. Despite that, the ability for those students to graduate if we don't support their entire education is 10% less than if we supported their entire education. So closing the gap on the economic barrier is key. This is a, is a graph that looks at our male graduation rates. And I, I get questions all the time about what we do around black males and getting them into college, et cetera. And you can see that the four-year graduation rate um, for this cohort of students who would have started in 2008 is about 30%, which means that two-thirds or 70% of the young men who enroll do not finish on time, which is the other thing that I will touch on because I feel very strongly about on-time graduation. So we get students who are high with higher academic preparation, but they are in very low economic, low income brackets. And I'm amazed as I go around and give talks about Howard, people have an impression that the Howard University student is coming from an upper middle class family where both parents are professionals and they are writing full checks to go to Howard University. <laughs> and that's not the case. The next one I run into will be the first one. So we must create opportunities for them to enroll and excel regardless of their income status. And I, I want you to pay attention to some of these slides here because there's some very interesting data here. If you look at the SAT scores by family income, you can see what is happening here from a trend point of view. If you make more than 200,000, you're more likely than not to have a much higher SAT score than if you make less than 20,000. However, if you look at these scores by race, something very interesting happens here. And I want you to pay attention to under 20,000. If you're a white American and you come from a family where the family, the household income is less than 20,000, the average SAT score is 978. If you are a black American, you look all the way to the right on this slide, and you come from a family where the income is greater than 200,000, the average SAT score is only 981. Three points difference, despite the fact that you may have been going to private schools, et cetera, because of the family income. So clearly, there are biases embedded within our educational system that still persist regardless of income. And that is something that we have to stop and take note of. What's just as interesting is that if you look at the average SAT score for the Howard student <coughs> coming into our university in 2014, the average SAT score overall was over 1,100. Miles away from the average SAT score of all takers of the test of African, who can be described as African American or black, of 855. So we get a very high academic performing student at Howard University. But look at this. The Pell Grant eligibility of my student body is almost 60%. And look at the peer institutions in my cohort middle states group. The highest, the closest to us is Temple at 27%. And the lowest is Wash U in St. Louis at 5%. So clearly, not students in the same socioeconomic bracket. When you look at the universities right here in DC, the private institutions in particular, when I talk about those, I, I'm mentioning George Washington, Georgetown, and American. 12, 14, and 19% per grant eligibility compared to Howard's at 59%. And then when you look at among the HBCUs, 
There are few schools that are higher than us. Florida A&M at 68% and Norfolk State University. These are state institutions where the tuition per year is about 5,500 if you're an in-state student, which means if you get the maximum Pell Grant award at these institutions, you already have your tuition covered. So it's a very significant difference to the $23,000 in tuition you have to pay at Howard University. So the health indicators um, for our undergrad students clearly demonstrate that those we have a significant um, student body with significant need, and it affects their performance if you look at the bottom graph in terms of the GPA they're able to obtain based on the economic stratification as well. And it's something that we are certainly sensitive to to make sure that we can impact this. The adjusted gross income as well is also extremely important. 27% of our students have families with an average adjusted gross income of just $13,000. And when you think of a tuition at 23, you can imagine how difficult it is for those students to see their way to the finish line. So we think it's extremely important that we continue to support that student base. And I mentioned this um, earlier in terms of the national graduation rate uh, average and the Howard graduation rate. And you can see we consistently beat the national graduation rate despite the economic circumstance of our students. Even when you look at our students with Pell and you compare to the national um, average, we still outpace um, the national average. What's also important is that we have found that if we support our students um, fully, as in this slide right here, we will increase that graduation rate by almost 10% if we take economics off of the table um, for that student body. And so some of the things that we're doing at the university certainly are directed at this. I can't give a talk of this nature and not mention HBCUs in general because we are in the newspaper for all the wrong reasons. Recently, people are questioning whether or not HBCUs should exist. There are 105 of them presently. And we account for the enrollment of 312,000 students. We represent about 4% of all four-year institutions in this country. But we are responsible for 21% of all of the bachelor's degrees in this, country, in this country that are awarded to African Americans. So when people ask me about the need for HBCUs, I tell them it's not an issue of relevance, it's an issue of excellence. Those inst these institutions must continue to be supported because they result in the diversification of our workforce today. And if they don't, there would be dramatic shifts in what our workforce would look like. And I'll give you a couple examples. Meharry and Howard Dental School we account for 50% of the black dentists trained in this country today. There's not another dental school in the city. Howard University is the only dental school in Washington, D.C. Now, our society that we live in is obsessed with branding, and therefore the facts become irrelevant. In a study of Marylanders, a survey of Marylanders recently, they will, pull, they will pose the question, what is the best law school in Maryland? And what do you think the number one answer was? Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins does not have a law school. <laughs> so it would be fine if they had a law school. Right? But it just goes to show you that uh, we get a skewed impression of what needs to happen in our society without relying on hard data and facts. 34% of African Americans who receive bachelor's degrees in the STEM disciplines, such as physics, chemistry, astronomy, math, and biology, come from HBCUs. And of the top 10 colleges whose African American graduates went on to get PhDs in science and engineering, the top eight were HBCUs. Number one was Howard University. If you look at this list, Stanford, MIT, and Harvard combined over the past decade sent less African Americans from their undergraduate programs to STEM PhDs than Howard. All three of those institutions combined sent less to STEM PhD programs than Howard University did. So it can't be an issue of relevance. It has to be an issue of excellence. And you can see here, this, regardless of what science you break down, you can see where Howard University is. And again, you can see from the list the role that HBCUs um, is playing in terms of that production. This slide is extremely important. 
Um, Norm Francis, the president of Xavier University, will step down um, this year as the president after 46 years. He is the longest serving president of an American university and I think needs to be applauded because without a hospital or a med school on their campus, they have sent more student, students of color to medical school than any other institution. You can see that Howard University is second on this list. And as I told um, President Francis, as soon as he steps down next year when he comes to Howard to receive his honorary degree, he will be number two on this list um, by next year. <laughs> University of Florida, though, is number three on this list. And I mentioned University of Florida because in the past five years, their black enrollment for their incoming freshman class has dropped by 50%, which means that the 59 students or so that they send to medical school will probably drop significantly. And if it does, the number of students who are being sent to medical school from University of Florida will drop precipitously, in my opinion. And therefore, this chart will look very, very different. Again, if you take University of Florida off this list, you're left with Duke, University of Maryland, College Park, and Florida State University as the, uh, the schools in the top 10 that will still be producing the numbers. And those numbers, in my opinion, are very small, um, just to be realistic, especially when you compare the 59 black students from University of Florida to the 550 that they send um, to medical school, at least in terms of applications. So I think it's extremely important to look at that. The other thing I want to mention around our medical school, and this is why I say it is about excellence. In 2010, we admitted 115 students, graduated 104 um, in that time. This is what I think is key about a Howard University and why that opportunity is very important in terms of our society. Between 2007 and 2014, you can see the average MCAT score for Howard versus all students applying for medical school. The gap was as much as six points back in 07. It's now down to about 4.7, but it still means that we are providing an opportunity for those who otherwise would not get into the majority of our medical schools in this country. So some people say, if we do that, are we compromising quality? Well, here's the answer. If you look back at 2007, the pass rate on the board exams was about 72% compared to the national average of 94. In 2014, that average is 94%, which is statistically not different to the national average. So what we are producing in terms of the outcomes by giving opportunity to these young men and women, we're doing it in an excellent fashion. There's no compromise of quality by providing them that opportunity, and I think that's important. We have to reach back into the pipeline, and the earlier we do that, the better the outcomes are. And if you look at the current pipeline, Howard University has a middle school on its campus dedicated to math and science. The students who come there, often the computers that we give them, is a, it's the first computer in their household, and they make very good use of it. The first class are now sophomores in college, and 95% of them attended college because of that early exposure as well as because of the fact that they are coming to school on a university campus, in my opinion. So the Howard University School of Ed Education also has garnered numerous research awards that help make it a driving force in the diversification of the STEM pipeline. And as we all know, when we look at jobs of the future, especially for what you do here at the FCC, this the STEM in particular is going to be a significant aspect of what the jobs in the future will look like and having more people get a STEM education is going to be critical. As I said, our 2014 graduating class included 106 PhD recipients. We're the only institution in the country that has ever graduated in any graduating class 100 plus African American PhD recipients and we will continue um, to do that for the near future. There are a few proposed accelerated degree programs that we're interested in at Howard University. There are lots of students of color who attend community colleges, two-year colleges, and it's because of financial capacity and not academic aptitude. So we are looking at proposed programs where we would encourage um, students enrolled at community colleges to join Howard 
and we would have a fast track program to the JD, the MD, and the PhD. We often talk to these students about getting a bachelor's degree. But I think we have to start encouraging those students to go from getting an associate's degree to an MD, or go from getting an associate's degree to getting a JD, or for that matter, a PhD. And so we will be rolling that out. We recently have rolled out our dual enrollment program with the DC public school system. Um, I'm happy to announce um, this will begin in the fall. We will bring students from two high schools, Banneker and McKinley Tech. We will enroll them in the junior year and they will take credits that they can use um, towards high school graduation as well as we plan on having them finish at least 12 to 15 credits during that period of time. We talk about student debt, but I think we have to have innovative programs like these in order to tackle the issue of student debt. They will not pay um, for those two years of attendance while they're in high school and therefore for their families it will be taking almost an entire semester um, off of their college education and we think that that will certainly help them. We have launched an Office of Undergraduate Studies as well at Howard and we think it's important to have this because we must proactively identify the potential barriers to academic progress and develop the appropriate interventions. Take something as simple as signing up for 15 credits is something that we've noticed is a huge barrier. Students in their first semester may sign up for 12 credits because to be considered a full-time student and qualify for financial aid, you simply need 12 credits. The thing is that sets you back. You need 120 credits to graduate. You need to take at least 30 credits a year. If you take 12 credits the first two semesters, you're automatically six credits behind and trying to catch up and at the cost of an education today, that's not something that we think we want our students doing. So we've launched a couple of programs. One is the GRACE program, Graduation and Retention Access to Continued Excellence program, where students who have a zero expected family contribution qualify for the maximum Pell Grant award at Howard University. We now pay 100% of the remaining tuition and mandatory fees if they receive that maximum award, have a cumulative GPA of 2.5 or higher, uh, and are on track for graduation as determined by their school and college. In other words, we are investing in removing that financial barrier. The other thing that we will roll out this year as well is a tuition rebate program. Any student at Howard University who graduates on time or earlier will receive 50% of the direct payments they made to the university in that last semester. We will give them back 50% of the money that they use in direct payments. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite slides. Um, equality doesn't mean justice. And sometimes when we discuss affirmative action and we discuss equal opportunity, I think we get the wrong nomenclature. This is about justice. And as you can see in this slide here, you can give everybody the same stool. But if everybody starts off from a different place, they will only get but so far. And what justice is, is making sure that everybody gets the appropriate investment for the circumstances that they're in. We look at our television screens today and we look at Baltimore and we ask ourselves questions and people will call the young men and women who are participating in activities that we would not like to see them participate in, calling them by names. But that's an image on a screen captured in a reaction to years and years of living in an oppressed circumstance. And are we going to invest in those communities? Are we going to make those schools better? We have been obsessed with a CVS that's on fire. No one has asked about where do they get fresh vegetables from? Are there grocery stores within walking distance? Are there safe places after school to study, to engage in activities? that would look different. And so I think we must broaden our discussion from equality to <clears throat> justice. Man's greatest imperfection is his passive acceptance of his imperfections. And this is something, a philosophy that I live by. I think it's important to note. And we have biases in our society that we must be cognizant of all the time. Most of our biases, however, are unconscious biases. If I were to put on a pair of jeans, sneakers and a hooded sweatshirt and stand on a corner and I give you 10 things to choose from to identify what you think that young man in the corner did. Was he the president of a university, a cancer surgeon, and a married devoted husband and father who lives in the same house with his two kids? 
would that be the top three things that you would pick? Probably not. But as I was preparing this slide, my wife also pointed out to me that my son was in full surgical regalia, and my left-handed daughter, and I haven't seen a bad left-handed surgeon, was in cheerleading attire. And so I had to change this slide to let you know that all that bias exists in all of us, and not just, so I'm not here to preach, as it were, but to be introspective. We all have those biases, and we must all make sure that we work to eliminate those biases. Thanks for your attention. that uh, I, I just don't even know where to begin. Um, I could go on for hours and hours and we don't have the time here, but I wanted to make sure to allow individuals here to ask a question or two, and I understand that Commissioner Clyburn has joined us, so I'm going to ask her if she has some comments or would like to, to make, have a question or something of that sort. Thank you. <laughs> Madam President, thank you so much. Uh, good morning again, everyone. It is my pleasure to meet you, Doctor. I've been hearing about um, you. Uh, we've got a lot of mutual friends. Um, and I heard an incredible sermon, sermon and I will say um, an academic sermon, um, that you uh, did this year um, at Howard that really was so compelling to me. In fact, your CD is in my car right now. Uh, okay. And so I, I would like to... Um, to tee things off, I, I apologize for missing the, uh, the beginning, but you ended on a note that I think is a, is a sort of check to all of us in terms of our internal biases and how um, oftentimes that is passed on in a way that, um, that inhibits um, uh, uh, the, the best in all of us. So uh, I, I, I just wanted to, to let you know that um, that seed um, is something that we're trying to, um, to, to better till and to better get rid of the externals of that and, and make sure that we're on a, a, a playing field. So not so much of a question, but you've got some people in the room that through regulation are trying to uh, remove a, a, a lot of those barriers. And so you've got a partner here, and um, I would like for us to, in a more firm way, solidify that relationship. So no question, but uh, uh, an acknowledgement to you that you've got uh, hundreds of partners in this room that are willing to do what it takes. To, to perpetuate the best in all of us. So thank you again very much. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. I think we have time for just probably one question from the audience if someone does have a question. And we're excited that um, National President Darlene Young is here and she can offer some closing remarks. But before that, do we have one question from the audience? Um, we'll, 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 okay. Of Howard University, but I wanted to ask you: um, Is there more of a push to let the federal government know that contributions can be made to Howard and other universities through the CFC campaign? Because I had to initiate that contact with the school and try to get them to follow up and getting that information out. Yeah, there's a push um, on all fronts for us to expand our development. Um, platform and to increase philanthropy through all methods. Um, we, we recently sent out an email for, to start a gift a senior campaign, um, and the response has been overwhelming. You know, seniors who will graduate next week who are balances, um, we think it's important that we get them over the finish line, and our alum have responded. So on all those um, platforms, we, we are attempting to do that. And I think just to speak to the comment that was made earlier about our biases as well, you know, I think the other thing that we have to be cognizant of is that in 2016, we will have a presidential election that very likely will produce um, uh, someone who will occupy the White House, a president who will occupy the White House who doesn't look like the current president. I point that out because my 10 and 8 year old, who you just saw pictures of, will probably wake up that November morning and ask me what happened to the White House. Because currently, they have grown up in a society and in a time where the only person they know in that White House is someone who looks like them. As far as my kids are concerned, they have a bigger house and it's white. That's the only difference between that family and our family. 
my son and daughter do not see the White House or getting to the White House as a barrier. They don't see it the way we see it because of our experiences. And we have to keep that in mind as well as we talk about biases. Right? My son was watching CNN um, in 2008. Um, he, 2010, he was six years old at the time. And they were complaining about the economy. And he said to me, why did President Obama mess up the economy? And I got on him. For 20, 30 minutes, I was giving him a lecture about <laughs> Keynesian economics and you name it. I was on him. At the time, by the time I was done, he looked at me and said, well, why aren't you the president? <laughs> you <know? clears throat> and the only response I could give him, right? Think about 30, 40 years from in, in the past, as we talk about the history of black culture, 40 years ago, I could easily answer that question. My only answer to that question was I wasn't born here. That was the only answer I could give him that would satisfy him. Because we now live in a circumstance where although there are still barriers and ceilings that must be broken down, the expectation of the next generation is very different from our expectations. And we can't allow our experiences, good or bad, to limit their possibilities for where they are going to take their lives. And we can't continue to be cynical because of images that we see on a television set that does not truly represent what America is. I, Wolf Blitzer interviewed me today for a webcast and I told him, I wish that CNN would come to Howard University once a week, just once a week, and spend 10 minutes interviewing two students once a week. And I think people would get a very different impression of what black America is about. So I hope that you all as well would not be as cynical about our future because I think we have a very bright future in this country. Dr. Frederick, I'm going to invite you to remain with us a little longer so that people have an opportunity to speak with you. And in follow-up to what you just spoke of, I think it was about um, the Sunday before last, um, NPR had a spot on graduates of Howard University. And I encourage people to try and pull that up on the web because it was a wonderful experience of young people where they come from, where they're going to, music that has influenced their lives. It's really worth listening to and I think it goes to, to your point of um, you know, what, what young African Americans are doing throughout um, in their lives and in their ambitions and things of that nature. So I do encourage people to check that out on the web. Um, and. Uh, I'm going to offer um, our president, national president, Darlene Young, to make some closing remarks um, to our, our uh, occasion today. So let me give the mic to her. Oh, she's going to the podium. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bryant, for allowing me to bring some closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Frederick, for the education about Howard, but also about where we are in our society. To Commissioner Claiborne, it's always happy to see you here. On behalf of the National Organization of Blacks in Government, I just want to say thank you all and thank the FCC chapter for having a speaker's program which brings in speakers that enlighten us and educates us. It truly was a pleasure for me to sit there and learn so much. Uh, blacks in Government is also in the mindset that our young people are our future and we do have our STEM program. We launched it last year, it's the first time, and we're moving forward with it again this year at our NTI in Orlando, Florida. So we too are on that path of understanding that our kids have to come first. Uh, we have our oratorical competition as well that deals with that, and we've gone a step further um, under our predecessor, my predecessor president, Mr. J. David Rees, he came out with the uh, thought about the future leader of America and government. And so the flag program, which we call it, has chapters across the country, and they have the, un the high school students as well as undergraduates. And so I look forward to having a conversation with you, Dr. Frederick, about having a flag program at Howard University, especially since our national headquarters is only about two blocks from Howard University. <laughs> only makes sense. So 
on behalf of the Black Sin Government Organization, we just thank you and Howard University for what you do. I thank the FCC chapter here for all that you do. I would go remiss if I did not mention my National Board of Director, Mr. Wesley Jarman. There are several past presidents of FCC in here, Shirley Suggs, Wesley Jarman, and also we have our Regional Council First Vice President. Huh? Oh, you're second. Oh, that's all right. You're going to be first next. And you may be the council president. You never know. We're happy to have them here with us today, too. One of the other things that I got to do before I sit down, Ms. Cynthia, is just give a shout out that Ms. Cynthia Bryan and there are several others in the audience that are DYLA graduates. So if you are a DYLA graduate, please stand up and be recognized. These are folks who went through an eight month program leadership that blacks in government was able to come together and have. So I always have to give recognition to the DYLA graduates. I thank you for allowing me to come up and give you a few brief words. And I again enjoyed the speaker series immensely. Thank you. Okay, so as we conclude our program, um, Dr. Frederick, our modest chapter has a bit of a gift for you to thank you for coming. Uh, okay. And um, thank we thank you, you so best. much. We enjoyed it. It was incredible. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. And I invite everyone to stay and have refreshments and speak further with Dr. Frederick as long as he has time. Thank you. Thank you.